Hey there, we are so thankful that you have made the choice to watch one of ACC's messages online. You know, as you are watching and diving into the truths that are being shared, we challenge you. You're sitting at your phone or your computer, hop on social media and be sure to use the hashtag you belong at ACC as God is teaching you different things during this message. But you know, we say you belong at ACC and we truly mean that, which means we would love to have you join us during one, our, one of our Sunday services at 8.30, 10 a.m. or 11.30 a.m. here at 710 Aqua Heart Road. So we would love to have you jump into this message and we're believing God is gonna do some awesome things in your life today. Hey guys, my name is Matt Hanneken. I'm with a company called Heat Tape Solutions and we are a commercial contractor that keeps pipes from freezing. In 1999, my father founded this company on the basis that he wanted to go out and fulfill the great commission of Christ in the construction industry, making disciples and seeing lives changed in the name of Jesus. I joined him in 2007, a week before I got married, and I stepped out in faith and said, God, I just want to see something different. I want my life to mean something. I want to live for you. And so when I asked my father about the, the possibility of joining him, he said, why do you want to come out at three o'clock in the morning and freeze your, your, your skin off here uh, and, and work with me? And I said, Dad, you're making a difference in the lives of people. And I'm seeing your faith increase as you go. And so I wanted that. I want that for my life and for my family. So God has blown me away since then. Since 2007, we go out on a daily basis and we wear a shirt like this one that says Jesus. And the back of it says, to God be the glory. And we invite people, would you come with us? Would you have Bible studies? Would you open God's word? Can we pray before this meeting? As we go, there's no doubt that people know that we're followers of Christ. Some people will hold their tongue and they won't even say anything. They won't uh, encourage us or come against us. But after we leave, we know that God is continuing the work that has begun on that day just because his name was elevated. So as we go out, we, we you know, are unashamed and we invite others to come out and be unashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Wear his name proudly. Go out and say, my life is different because of Jesus' presence, his Holy Spirit living in me. My name is Matt Hanneken, and I invite you to live unashamed for Jesus at work with me. Good morning, 10 o'clock. How are you guys doing this morning? Hey, I, uh, I wanted to remind you all that we are in a kind of a new culture setting uh, season where we're going to start bringing our Bibles to church with us, right? So if you got your Bible with you today, hold it up. Let me see it. If you don't own a Bible, so you don't have one to hold up to bring with you, just grab one from the chair back in front of you. Uh, grab that Bible, write your name in it, and uh, we want you to keep that. Because there's something really special about bringing our Bible with us. It'll allow us to, to underline some things together, to, to highlight some things, to write in the margins. It's, it's good to have that also just so you can learn how to find things in your Bible and, and more about how to use it. Uh, real fast, I want to apologize. I wasn't kind of out front uh, for the service before service, and I won't be out there after because I'm not feeling great. I might uh, be coughing a little bit. Um, this is the splash zone right here. All right. Um, we're all good. We're all good. Hey, so we, uh, did I already introduce myself? I'm Matt, lead pastor. All right. Hey, yeah, cool. So we are in a series right now uh, called Jesus at Work, and we're talking about the importance of, of the fact that we spend 150,000 hours on average in our lifetime at work. 40% of our awake life is spent at work. And whether you're part-time or full-time, whether you're a student and that's your job right now, maybe you're a stay-at-home parent and that's your job right now, maybe you're retired and most of the work you do now is on a volunteer basis, maybe you're self-employed and you're, you're spending way more than 40 hours a week at work, you know what I'm talking about. All of us are spending time at work and what we talked about last week was that's kind of our work life, you know, we, we spend a lot of time in work, doing the things that God's called us to do, to use the gifts He's given to us to, to, to work and to earn a living and all those things. But at the end of the day, we also know that God's called us to a work beyond our vocation. He's called us to what I would call our life's work. 
the ultimate calling that he has on all of our lives in this room, I want you to know, is to go out into the world and to tell people about Jesus, that all of us are called to, to be a part of this incredible calling. In Acts 20, verse 24, it says this, but my life is worth nothing to me unless I use it for finishing the work, there's that word, the work assigned to me by the Lord Jesus, the work of telling others the good news about the wonderful grace of God. So what this verse is saying is it uses the word work two times, right? But it's not the work of our vocation. It's not the the job you're going to go to tomorrow. This is the ultimate work that all of us have been called to. This is the, 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 the work of telling others the good news about the wonderful grace of God. I want you to know right now that if you're in this room and you've made a decision to follow Jesus, Jesus has a calling for you. You don't have to wonder whether or not this is for you. This is for all of us, that he's called you to this work of telling other people about Jesus. And if you think about it for a moment, if you spend 40% of your awake life at work, then this is one of the most incredible mission fields you will ever experience. This is an incredible opportunity for you to be light in darkness. And we want to talk about what that looks like and why we need to do that. All of you are, are, you know, you have this incredible opportunity at work. In Acts 1, it says this, But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. And you will be my witnesses. Say that word with me. You will be my witnesses. So ultimately what this verse is telling us that all of us are called to be this, this word, this word a witness. Now when I take the word witness and I think about where I would normally use that word and in, in where we see that word pop up from time to time, it would be in the context, right, of like a courtroom. We understand what a witness is. A witness is someone who gets up on the stand and tells people simply, here's what I've experienced. Here's what I saw. Here's what Jesus did in my life. Now, the funny thing is, oftentimes we get the other roles in the courtroom confused. Like we go out into the world and we're like, I'm going to take on the role of judge. I'm going to go out and I'm going to be the judge. I'm going to look at my coworkers. I'm going to look at my neighbors and I'm like, man, that guy's bad. That guy's pretty good. They're going to hell. You know, like, and we, we go into the world, and instead of taking on the role of a witness, we take on the role of, of a judge. And we're not called to do that. Sometimes we maybe take on the role of an attorney. Like, hey, I'm going to go into my workplace, and what I'm going to do, instead of just being a witness, I'm going to argue with someone until they give their life to Jesus. I'm going to find someone and they don't agree with me and we're just going to argue this thing out. And I'm going to attorney my way. I'm going to attorney their way into heaven. And we we act like a lawyer. That's not what we're called to do. And we also know that we're not called to be uh, what might be the worst, like a court reporter. Like, hey, I'm just going to go. I'm not going to do anything or say anything. I'm just going to write down and remember everything that's happening. I'm just going to kind of take it all in and never open my mouth. You see, God doesn't call us to be judges. He doesn't call us to be attorneys. He doesn't call us to be court reporters. He calls us to be what? Witnesses. He calls us to tell people about what's happening in our lives. And the way that verse finishes, it says, You will be my witnesses telling people about me everywhere, in Jerusalem, throughout Judea, in Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. That's really, really powerful stuff. We are called to tell people what we've experienced firsthand. You know, there's a really powerful prayer. It's one of my favorite prayers recorded in Scripture because it's Jesus praying to his Father. Have you ever thought about that? Have you ever wondered if you're kind of weird talking to yourself? This is Jesus praying to himself, essentially what's happening here, right? Jesus is talking to God the Father in John 17. And he's ultimately saying, keep my disciples from evil, make them holy and full of truth. And then he says, just as you, dad, sent me into this world, I am now sending my disciples into the world as my witnesses. So what that means is that you and I, as disciples of Christ, we have to be full of truth. We need to be kept from evil so that we can go out into the world and be effective witnesses, that we can 
actually have a, 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 a testimony that when we give it, people aren't going to be able to immediately just tear it apart and say, you can't listen to anything that guy said. We're called to go into the world and be witnesses. In fact, I want you to know that you in this room right now, if you are a follower of Jesus, listen, you are a missionary. Did you know that? Sometimes we hear the word missionary and we think, uh, oh, I know what a missionary is. It's the, that family that's right now on my refrigerator. You know, I'm praying for them. I maybe support them. And they're somewhere else in a third world country in, in another environment. And they're in the slums somewhere. And they're just really kind of, that's what a missionary is. That's maybe what you're thinking. But right now, I want you to know the Bible says very clearly that all of us have been called to take the good news and to be witnesses in the world that God's called us into. And for many of us, the 40% of your awake life being in the workplace that you're spending time in, this is your mission field. This is where you can be most effective as, as a missionary. You are a missionary, whether you like it or not. All right, you don't have to wonder whether or not God has called you to this. He has. Let me share with you briefly why we need to share the gospel. Why we need to share the gospel at work. The first one is this. You have a life-saving message. Did you know that? You have what other people need to hear. There's something powerful about the truth of the gospel, and you know it. You've embraced it. You've experienced it. You have the ability to take that life-saving, that life-giving message, and to share it with other people. In Romans 10, it says, For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. But then it goes on. It says, but how can they call on him to save them unless they believe in him? And how can they believe in him if they have never heard about him? And how can they hear about him unless somebody tells them? See, what it's saying is how can people know about a Jesus who loves them? How can people really understand that God sent his son to this earth to die for them unless, get this, you tell them? And we have an opportunity to, to tell people about this life-saving message, and we ought to do that. Here's another reason why we share the gospel at work. And you might not believe this, but I want you to know people are hungry for it. People are hungry to hear it. In fact, many of us, we've convinced ourselves that nobody would want to hear us talk about our faith. That if we were to tell someone about our faith, they would just kind of tune us out, that we'd ruin our relationship, that we'd be that weird guy, that nobody around us wants us to, to talk about it. In, in Matthew 9, uh, this is, is a verse about Jesus. It says, when he, when Jesus saw the crowds, he had compassion on them because they were confused and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. He said to his disciples, the harvest is great, but the workers are are few. What Jesus is saying is when you go into your workplace, the harvest, listen, the harvest is plentiful. There is so much to harvest within your workplace. But then he also says, unfortunately, that the workers are few. There's not enough of us going out into that mission field and actually harvesting and actually doing the work that God has called us to. And the reason why is I'm convinced the enemy has tricked us into thinking that nobody wants to hear what we have to say. If you believe that right now, if you believe that nobody would want to hear you talk about the good news, that it would ruin a relationship, that it would mess up your job, that it would make things awkward at work, I want you to know that that's not true. In fact, recent research, the Pew Research uh, Foundation, they did a, a, pro, a, a research project, 35,000 regular people just like you uh, but unchurched and churched, and just a mix of a random assortment of 35,000 people. And what they found out in that research was that 93% of the people asked said they wanted to and were open to having spiritual conversations. Only 7% of the people asked said, I wouldn't want to have a conversation about my spiritual life with someone else. Listen, people want the life-saving message you have. They know, just like Jesus saw these people who were lost and hopeless and wandering around like sheep without a shepherd, people, listen, you all know what it feels like to be lost. 
You've been somewhere in your car before and you realize that you have no idea where you are. Maybe it takes you a while to admit it, but you know it, right? You know that I have no idea where I'm at. And people all over this world know that, that they are hopeless. They know that they don't know what their purpose is. They, they know that they're not feeling quite right and they're hungry for a life-saving, life-giving, hope-filled message that you have. So we understand why we need to share the gospel, but many of you probably are saying, like, how? How do I share the gospel at work? Like, Matt, you don't understand. Like, if I were in my workplace and I were to share the gospel, I could lose my job. Like, maybe, my, maybe you have a boss who won't be uh, real happy about you sharing the gospel at work. Maybe you are in a workplace where you, the person sitting next to you, you know that for the next 20 years you guys have to like get along and there's like an awkwardness and if you bring up something that, that could really make that weird or maybe there's a, uh, like some sort of political power struggle going on and you're like, how do, how do I sh- share my faith in this environment in a way that makes sense? How do I share my faith in a way that's effective? How can I be strategic about sharing my faith? And I want to uh, tackle that with you. I want to show you in scripture, how I think we ought to do that. In Colossians 3, it says, and whatever you do or say, you say those last three words with me again, and whatever you do or say, do it as a representative of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks through him to God the Father. You see, there's two parts. It's whatever you do and whatever you say. And here's why I love the order of those two words. Because oftentimes, we recognize that before we care about what someone has to say, we want to see whether or not their walk can line up with their talk, right? Uh, Before you come to me and you're going to like talk the talk, I want to first see whether or not you can walk the walk. But right now, listen, if you are like the person at work that everyone can count on for like the, the crudest jokes and your language is kind of filthy, and you're always coming to work with a bad attitude, and you're always complaining about the boss and the work that they have you doing, and then in light of all that, one day you decide, you know, I'm going to step up, and I'm going to open my mouth, and I'm going to share my faith. Can I just ask you to do me a favor? Don't. Don't. You see, there, there's something about being the person you need to be and working on, 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 on being a representative of Christ and the things that you do before you open up your mouth and say, I'm going to put the label of follower of Christ on me so that when what you see in me, listen, we're all messed up people. We're all going to make mistakes. I'm not saying don't open your mouth until you've perfected life because that, that none of us would ever open our mouths. But what I am saying is we need to learn how to Walk the walk before we talk the talk. It's really kind of a, it's a building a relational trust. It's allowing someone to see something in you that says, you know what? I, I, I think that what Matt is saying must, I at least owe Matt the opportunity to listen because he's just, man, he's, he's, he's worth listening to. Let me show you the four things I would do in how to share your faith at work. I know this is a little bit unfair because I work at a church. (laughs) I guess that makes me like a professional Christian, right? I get paid to do good. You guys are good for nothing. (laughs) Just joking. (laughs) Just teasing. Um, No, for real though. You know, I, uh, before I was in, in ministry, just four years ago, before I was in vocational ministry, I, I lived day in and day out in, in a work environment just like you, and I understand the, the context of what does it look like for many of us who are in, in maybe a non-ministry job to do this. And let, me, let me walk through these steps with you. The first thing I would say we need to do is we need to love, serve, and pray for those around us. So here's the first thing you need to do to share the gospel work, by loving, serving, and praying for those around you. Here's why that love is the best place to start here. Because until you can learn to see people the way God sees people, you're not going to be able to, to, to love them the way you need to. You're not going to be able to, to care about them as deeply as you ought to. Now, let me show you this in Scripture. It says 
in 1 John 4.18, there is no fear in love, but perfect love drives out fear. There is no fear in love, but perfect love drives out fear. In fact, if you think about it, the, the number one reason I think most of us don't share our faith at work, we don't share our faith in our neighborhood, we don't share our faith with anyone around us, the number one reason I think we don't do it is uh, maybe two, two reasons. One, we don't know how to do it. We're going to take care of that now. But the, probably a bigger one is we're afraid. What's going to happen if I say the wrong thing or if I, uh, they ask me a question I don't know the answer? What, what happens if they reject me? Then that's going to be super awkward. So we, we allow fear to keep us from telling them about the life-giving message that we have. And and fear is not a good excuse because the Bible says that if you can learn to see people the way God sees them, if you can love them the way God loves them, that that perfect love is going to drive out fear. You're not going to be afraid anymore. You're going to say, man, I love you so much. I don't want to see you spend forever apart from Jesus. I love you so much. I don't, I can't help. But listen, if if this is going to make it awkward, I don't care because I got to tell you what I know. Perfect love drives out fear. You see, if we can learn to see people the way God does, a lot of things will happen. We'll be willing to serve them. I mean, think about it. God loved you so much that he gave his life for you. If you can love people the way God loves you, you'll be willing to to file their papers. You'll be willing to to stay over for them or to, to maybe loan them some of your personal time or whatever it takes. You're, you'll be willing to love them and serve them because that's the way God loves and treats you. You know, another thing, if you're able to see people the way God sees people, you'll, you won't seek fairness over purpose. You're not going to go to work constantly trying to make sure everything's fair. You know, I, 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 I did four of these and so my coworkers should have to do four. Why do I always have to do more? No, listen, God sent his son to this earth for a purpose. Now, if if Jesus said, you know what, I don't really care about my purpose. My purpose is just going to be fairness. I just want to do what's fair. You know what's fair? Fair would have been Jesus not dying on the cross in your place. It would have been you dying on the cross in your place. That's what fair looks like. But God loves you so much, he set aside fairness and instead provided grace and mercy And if we can see other people the way God sees them, we're not going to seek fairness over purpose. Another thing, we won't be afraid to share the gospel with them. It's a really big deal. Another thing I want to encourage you to do with this point number one is we need to pray. We need to pray for our coworkers. We need to pray for our boss. You need to pray for your customers. In fact, I want to encourage you to be specific. If you work in a workplace where you have like a hundred different people that fit into that category, pick three of them, maybe. Say, you know what, I just, God, put on my heart three people that I can be praying for. Maybe it's the person sitting to your right and the person sitting to your left or a person you interact with on a daily basis. And I want you to very specifically begin praying for them. Pray that God would start working in their heart and start tilling that soil so that as you're planting seeds and as you're making a difference and as you're doing some of the other things we're going to talk about, that it'll take root, that something will happen from it. Be praying for the people around you at work. Here's another thing I want to encourage you to do. We talked about this a little bit last week, but another way we share the gospel at work is by doing excellent work. Notice so far that one and two, we haven't said a thing yet. We haven't opened our mouth. We haven't uh, done any talking the talk, right? So far, we're just working on our walking the walk. We're working on, uh, on, on being a, a, an excellent representative of Christ. And one of the ways we do that is by doing excellent work. What I mean by that is I, we ought to hold ourselves to the highest standard of excellence, I want your boss to see what you do and to say, that is the best employee I got. I know when I entrust a project to them that I can count on it to get done right. I can count on it to get done well. Like we ought to have the highest standard of excellence, but not only the highest standard of excellence, we ought to have the highest standard of ethics. We need to know that everything that we do, 
all the, the ways that we represent the companies that we work for, that we put ourselves on the highest plane of, of professional ethics. There's a true story about um, Sir Arthur Conan Doyle, uh, kind of a ways back, and what he did as a practical joke, he sent a telegram to 12 influential government workers, uh, 12 people who were influential in the British government, and he sent 12 telegrams to them, and here's what the telegram said, get this. It was just a practical joke. He put, flee at once, all is discovered. <laughs> that was the telegram. No details, nothing. He checked back in six hours later, and all 12 of them were packing and making plans to leave the country. That's not what it looks like to be working above reproach and to be working at the highest standard of professional ethics. We ought to all know that the work that we do, we would be proud not only to put our name on it, but to know that we represent the name of Jesus Christ, that we can put that name on the work we do and say, I am doing this not just for my boss, not just for my customer, but I'm doing this as if I was doing it unto to God himself. In fact, if you remember that verse, from last week in Colossians 3. It says that we uh, work willingly at whatever you do, as though you were working for the Lord rather than for people. Remember that the Lord will give you an inheritance as your reward. The Lord, sorry, will give you an inheritance as your reward, and that the master you are serving is Christ. In other words, when you go to work and you do excellent work and you do highly ethical work, you're not doing it for your boss. You're not doing it for your customer. You're not doing it to help out a coworker. You're doing it as if you're doing it unto God. You can glorify him and worship him in your work. And by doing excellent work, you're going to open up opportunities to share the gospel. There's another verse that I thought was appropriate for this. It says in Proverbs 11.1, 1, it says, The Lord detests the use of dishonest scales but he delights in accurate weights. Now what this verse means is back in the day, right, it would be really easy for me to take a scale and make it purposely dishonest. So as I'm trying to figure out how much money you owe me and you're giving me shekels or gold or whatever it is, silver, that you're trying to pay me with, I know that my scale is purposely off so that I get more out of you than I'm supposed to. And the Bible says that, that in this version, in the NLT, it says the Lord detests in other versions, it says that when you use dishonest scales, it's an abomination to the Lord. And here's how you and I can still today use dishonest scales. We use dishonest scales when we lie on a time card. We use dishonest scales when we steal office supplies. When we fudge a mileage report. When we, you ready for this? Work from home. You know what I'm talking about. Tell your boss you're going to work from home and don't actually do any work while you're there. Maybe you're just using a dishonest scale when you pretend to be sick to not have to go into work. You see, God calls us to do excellent work. And what I want to encourage you to do is not only be loving, serving, and praying for your coworkers and those around you, but to make a, a commitment to doing excellent work in whatever God's called you to do. Excellence, what I mean by that is, is excellence from a, a, just the quality of your work and the highest standard of ethics. Here's a third thing. The third thing is another way you share the gospel at work is by a positive attitude. By my positive attitude, I can share the gospel at work. Again, notice that now I'm one, two, and three, and so far I haven't actually opened my mouth and said anything yet. We're still talking about walking the walk. And here's why I think this idea of a positive attitude is probably the most important one out of all, all these first three things we've talked about. Let me show you in Scripture. In Philippians 2, verses 14 and 15, it says, Do everything without complaining and arguing. When was the last time you did that at work? When was the last time you're like, man, I got through a day and I did everything I was supposed to do without any complaining, without any arguing, so that no one can criticize you? It says, live clean, innocent lives as children of God, shining like bright lights 
in a world full of crooked and perverse people. What this means is that by simply going into this broken world, in fact, I'm going to say that most of your workplaces, most workplaces for whatever reason around this world are very dark places. It's a place that people go, they're really, really excited when it's Friday, they just want to get in and get out, they don't want to stick around, nobody really enjoys, for the most part, uh, a workplace, it's not, it's not where you want to spend your time, it can be very dark from a perspective of just bad attitudes and bad kind of coarse uh, joking and all the stuff that can happen within a workplace. It can be a very, very dark place, and the Bible says that by simply going into the workplace with a positive attitude, it's like shining a bright light into a dark place. I don't know about you, but I don't normally turn on my headlights on my car during the daytime. It doesn't make sense. It doesn't make sense for me to shine a bright light into bright places. So if right now you're like, hey, I always put on my best attitude, I'm always, I have a smile on my face, and I'm always really happy when I walk into church and life group, I'm always just on my best behavior. You know what you're doing? You're shining a light into a bright place. It's not really going to make that big of a difference. The same way is if you go into a dark place and you don't shine a light into that place, you're just carrying darkness into darkness, and that's even worse. You're not going to make any difference. But the Bible says that simply by, by having a positive attitude, by not arguing and complaining, by being a person that's constantly carrying light into the workplace, you're carrying and shining light into a dark place, and it is so obvious to see when somebody is shining light into darkness. We can be set apart by always having a positive attitude, especially when others around us are struggling to see a reason why. Now, here's the fourth thing, and this one is where we're going to kind of shift. Numbers one, two, and three, we didn't have to say anything. The fourth way that we share the gospel at work is this, by opening our mouth. At some point, right, have you ever heard this, uh, it's a quote that's been attributed to St. Francis of Assisi. It says, um, preach the gospel at all times, and if necessary, use words. Have you heard that before? It sounds really kind of cute. It sounds like something you want to print out and put on a wall. But listen, don't. I don't, I, I, lo I love like the, the point of it. What it's saying is, hey, do numbers one, two, and three really well. Go out, have a positive attitude, love people, pray for people, all that stuff. And then the whole idea of if necessary, use words. Listen, use words. <laughs> Otherwise, people might just see you and say, wow, so-and-so is just a really nice guy. So-and-so is like an Eagle Scout. But it's using words that's going to set you apart from being a really nice guy to being a follower of Jesus, that Jesus is the reason for the hope that you have. We have the opportunity to open our mouth. And this is the fourth step. We need to eventually say something. We need to allow our talk to line up with our walk. Matt Chandler, he's a, he's a pastor in Texas, and he, he had a quote I, th I thought was helpful. He was talking about relational evangelism. Re relational evangelism is when you just, you just go out and you're just like a really nice guy and you just build relationships. And he said, so relational evangelism, go for it as long as it turns into real evangelism. You hanging out, having a beer with your buddy, so he can see that Christians are cool, is not what we're called to do. You're eventually going to have to, what? Open your mouth and share the gospel. That's really, really powerful stuff. You know, we, um, we have a series that's starting next Sunday. Uh, Pastor Dustin was telling you about it a little bit. It's this um, uncommon series where we're going to be sharing this pulpit with other pastors from other churches uh, throughout the month of March. And I want to make sure you all come to that. It's going to be a really exciting time to hear what God is doing throughout Glen Burnie from some other voices. I make sure you're here for that. But after that series is over, we're going to start a, a series called Story. It's our April series it's going into Easter and what the story series is about is we're all going to learn the benefit of of having a story and how to put your story together and how to share your story we're going to learn what that looks like and I want to share with you a little bit about how when you open your mouth that's going to be incredibly important 
In Colossians 4, 5, it says this. It says, live wisely among those who are not believers and make the most of every opportunity. If you see in this verse up here, we have that first part, uh, live wisely. Can you say that with me? Live wisely. Live wisely is steps one, two, and three. When you go out into the world and you are loving people and you're serving them and you're praying for them, when you go out into the world and you're doing excellent work and you're kind of holding yourself to really high standards, and when you go out into the world and you have a positive attitude, this is how you live wisely. This is how you live strategically for the cause of the gospel. All of us are called to live wisely. It says, live wisely among who? Your coworkers. Live wisely among those who don't know Jesus. Go out into your workplace, 40% of your awake life, and live wisely. But then the verse goes on, right? It says, uh, not only to live wisely among those who are not believers, but then it says, and, here's number four, make the most of every opportunity. In other words, opportunities are going to come up as you're living wisely. You're going to find yourself with opportunities to open your mouth. And we need to take those opportunities and we need to use them. We need to know them. We need to be able to hear them when they pop up. They're going to come up. In fact, if you do the first three steps, you will get opportunities to do the fourth. I'm going to say that again. If you do the first three steps at work, you will get opportunities to open your mouth. People will invite you to do it. In fact, in 1 Peter 3.15, it says, If someone asks you about your hope as a believer, always be ready to explain it. In other words, there are people who are going to see something different about you. They're going to see that you love them, that you serve them, that your attitude is always positive, that you're always producing excellent work. They're going to see something about you. It's going to be a hope within you that they notice, and they're going to then ask you. They're going to give you an opportunity. It says there, when someone asks you about your hope, always be ready to open your mouth. And I want you to know that these opportunities aren't always going to be super obvious. In fact, it's very rare that someone is going to come up to you at work and say, hey, Matt, man, you just are always in a really positive mood. Would you mind sharing the gospel with me? That's probably not going to happen like that, right? We need to have our ears tuned to the opportunities. Here's how it might sound. It might be uh, something like this. Hey, Matt, man, you, man, you just have so much joy. What's up with that? That's an opportunity. We're going to open our mouth. How about this? How come this thing that just happened that everyone else is frustrated about doesn't seem to be upsetting you? That's an opportunity. Open your mouth. How about this? Hey, can I get some advice from you? Here's what that is. When somebody comes up to you seeking advice, what they're saying is, I feel like you're kind of put together in this area and can offer some sort of wisdom to me. And they're asking you that because they see a hope in you. They see a light in you. Use that opportunity. Say, I'd be happy to share my heart with you. Maybe uh, that opportunity might just come from you opening up God's word at lunch or something. And somebody might just come up and say, hey, what are you reading? Man, let me tell you what I'm reading. You know, if you're wondering, what should I say when I open my mouth? It's really easy, Matt, for you to say, yeah, do all these things, and then I'll get opportunities to open my mouth. But I'm afraid to open my mouth because I'm not quite sure what to say when I open my mouth. Well, good news. I'm going to tell you what I do. And I want you to know first and foremost, whatever the Holy Spirit tells you to say when you open your mouth, don't listen to my advice if he's telling you something different, okay? If the Holy Spirit tells you to open your mouth and say something, then you say what the Holy Spirit is putting on your heart in that moment. If he says, I want you to say this, I want you to tell the story, I want you to whatever, I want you to point to this verse, do that. That's the best thing you can do. In fact, we see in Luke, uh, Luke 12, I believe. Yeah, Luke 12, 12. It says that the Holy Spirit gives us words to say. So that's a good reminder that when you're in one of those situations, trust the leading of the Holy Spirit. But here's what it usually looks like for me. And I want to encourage you by giving you a 4A and a 4B. 
when you open your mouth, here's what I think it probably should look like most of the time. The first one is this. Tell your story. When somebody says, what is going on? Remember, don't be a judge. Don't be an attorney. Don't be a court reporter. Get up on the witness stand and tell them. and Just say simply, Jesus changed my life. That's why I have so much joy. That's why I always do my best to, to not steal office supplies. That's why I don't participate in that joke that's going around. That's why, whatever. Jesus has changed my life. And we're going to learn, remember, in, in April what it means to, to tell your story. A good story has three parts. When we're talking about your testimony, it's before Jesus, then Jesus, and since Jesus. And we're going to learn in April together what it looks like to put your story together and how to share that when somebody asks you to share it. But that's the first thing. You're going to open up your mouth and you're going to tell your story. The second thing you want to do is you then want to invite them to get more. In other words, put the ball back in their court and say, hey, I want to invite you to a next step. And maybe that invitation sounds like this. Hey, I'd love to tell you more about Jesus if you're interested. Allow them to decide whether or not they want more information. Tell them that Jesus has changed your life and say, would, would you like more information about that? Maybe your invitation would sound like this. Hey, can I show you what the Bible has to say about that question? Or I'd love to have you join me at my church this Sunday. Maybe your invitation is an invitation to church. Maybe it's an invitation into your life group. Maybe it's simply, hey, do you have any place to go this Easter? My church is doing something really cool. I'd love to have you be a part of it. Maybe your invitation is, is inviting them into something that you're a part of. Maybe it's an invitation into God's word. Maybe it's an invitation into studying it with them. But here's the thing. You tell your story, and then you invite them into learning more. And I want to encourage you to do those steps with boldness. When you have opportunities to tell your story, you're going to see that in any good story, right, there's the, the before Christ and then you're, the since Christ. The, the, the since Christ is always going to have the gospel message in there. And then I realized, right, my story, right, uh, my before Christ is super short because I, I don't remember <laughs> that. I grew up in a Christian home, and I gave my life to Jesus when I was like five. So my, my story is, and I, I, I realized at a young age that I needed Jesus. And then I, I had an opportunity to recognize that Jesus uh, died on the cross for me, and that, uh, that through believing in him and trusting that God provided him as a, a substitute for me, that I'm now able to have a relationship with God. And I share the gospel as part of my story. And you'll have the opportunity, we're going to learn that together, how to tell your story and invite people to take next steps into hearing more. So here's my encouragement to you. By the way, one way I just said invite to take a next step. You all have an invitation right now in your hand. You can take this to work tomorrow and say, hey, my church is doing something really cool. We have other pastors from other churches that are they're coming into my church, and, and we're, it's kind of a unique thing. We're all kind of working together, and I'd love to have you come and, and hear that. You have an invitation. Let me encourage you with these verses. Romans 1, 16 says, For I am not ashamed of this good news about Christ. It is the power of God at work, saving everyone who believes, the Jew first and also the Gentile. And then we also see in 2 Timothy 1, it says, For God has not given us a spirit of fear and timidity, but of power, love, and self-discipline. So read these next words with me. So never be ashamed to tell others about our Lord. Church, I want to encourage you, never be ashamed to take the good news, to take the, 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 the witness, the story, the testimony that you have and to share it with other people. Walk the walk, and then when the opportunity arises, and it will, talk the talk. Tell people about how Jesus has changed your life. Tell them uh, the good news of the gospel, and then invite them to get more information. Put the ball in their court and invite them into church. Invite them into the Bible. Invite them into your life. 
Here's uh, what now, God. I want to give you a, a homework assignment. Here's what I want you to do. I want you to make a list of three people at work. Make a list of three people. Number two, pray for them. I want you to pray for those three people on a regular basis. I want you to be praying for them. And then number three, I want you to do something nice for them. Maybe file their papers or go buy them lunch or invite them out to, to over for dinner or whatever that might be. Do something nice for those three people. And then the final step here is if they ask why, and they might not ask why right away, but listen, if you do steps one, two, and three, people are always going to give you an opportunity to open well, we are so thankful for the truth that was shared in this message today. Please know that we as a staff and as a church are praying that what you have learned today, the truths that God has put deep down into your heart, will manifest themselves and grow themselves into something amazing. And as always, you can experience that with other believers, other people who are walking this walk of faith at ACC on a Sunday morning at 8.30, 10 a.m. or 11.30 a.m. As a reminder, please remember, you belong at ACC.